Well, good morning. Um, unfortunately, there is no break between the two sessions, but I think I'm going to use my prerogative as moderator to say it's okay to go and get coffee. Um, so we need to be uh, well caffeinated because we are going to have a great session now. Um, and the topic is a very, very important one. Robert Lucas, which is a Nobel Prize economist from the University of Chicago, once said that when you start thinking about economic development, you cannot stop thinking about it. But the same can be said for retirement security. This is an incredibly important topic. It really can come from very different, you can look at this from very different ways and you can also consider many different solutions. What is at stake in the next session is actually talking about state and local workers. As you know, we have 24 million state and local workers, and about a quarter of them are actually not participating to Social Security, but they are covered instead by these state and local pensions. Um, so we can kind of think uh, at the questions, you know, should instead, should we have a more uh, universal coverage of all workers? And in particular, in the current situations where a lot of states are actually experience a lot of financial difficulties and some of their coverage uh, really push for, um, you know, being potentially underfunded, you know, can we think of a solution about having, or of course we are only talking about the new hires be covered by social security. This is of course a very important, but also a very difficult topic, right? The first question we can ask is, will this uh, worker benefit from being covered by social security versus a state and local pensions? And as I always remind my students when we talk about Social Security, Social Security does not only provide pension benefit, it also provides a lot of other coverage, for example, survivor benefit, disability benefit, and really importantly, an inflation index annuity that you cannot buy in the market. So Social Security is an uh, incredible institution in a, um, and you know, should some worker really not be covered by that? There is, of course, the other issues that, well, perhaps even Social Security is going to experience problem. And as you know, in the way the Social Security is set up as a pay-as-you-go system, right, we have, uh, in a sense, given to the first generation, and so everybody has now to share this legacy, the, uh, has to pay for the legacy cost, right, of having given to the first generations. So would the state and local worker actually really benefit for joining uh, the social security system? As you can imagine, this is a really, really complex topic, and that's why you know, it's, it's very exciting to have such a really um, well done paper by Bill Gales and David John. David seems to have an infinite amount of time or perhaps he doesn't sleep. Um, and um, I want to uh, give the floor now to Bill who is uh, really going to provide you know, this incredible uh, analysis and, and really calculations about you know, the will worker benefit, what are the costs of social security of doing such an initiative and really understanding the policy implication of these important questions. We have an amazing group of discussants, you know, people who I cannot think of uh, two better experts on this topic. So without further ado, Bill, this is uh, for you to present. All right, we just need the... Uh slideshow uh, to work. Uh, oh, it's working, okay. Uh, I should mention both papers uh, are on our website, uh, the, the paper that David presented earlier and, and, and this paper. Uh, and this paper is uh, jointly authored with Sarah Holmes, who uh, is not here today, but uh, uh, played a pivotal role in writing it. 
the issue here uh, is, oh, let me, let me be clear to you. We're sort of changing gears entirely from the first session. The first session focused on uh, workers in the private sector who had Social Security but did not have employer-sponsored pensions. This section, this session is focusing on workers in the public sector who do have employer-sponsored pensions but don't have Social Security. So uh, uh, it's, it's a completely different uh, uh, set of people we're talking about. Uh, basically, as was mentioned, about a quarter of state and local government workers uh, are not covered by Social Security in their current jobs. Some of these, of course, are covered by having worked in, in Social Security covered jobs earlier uh, in their life. Some of them are covered uh, under the spousal rules under Social Security. Uh, but there's been this long-standing question is should these people be uh, moved into the Social Security system? Should we extend Social Security coverage to all state and local government workers? Uh, and typically in the political arena, uh, something like that would be phased in, and the question then becomes, should we extend Social Security coverage to all uh, new state and local government workers? So we're not really debating putting in all government workers, uh, you know, who, a 60-year-old who's been working in state government for, for 30 years, and we're not debating whether they should come in and get credit for all their 30 years, where typically the debate is limited to, to uh, new workers. And the, the, the traditional arguments on this coming from a Social Security perspective argue that it would be a good idea uh, the uh, pension situation that state and localities have faced recently uh, provide a new reason to re-examine this issue. On the one hand, uh, if state pensions are more insecure, that gives you an increased need for retirement security. On the other hand, if state pensions are facing funding shortfalls, that makes it even harder to add to the burden of retirement saving uh, at this point for those workers. Uh, one way to think about it, though, is this, this is sort of a transition issue. That doesn't mean it's minor, but, but if, just do the following thought experiment, if all state and local government workers were covered, right, we would not be talking about removing coverage for a quarter of them. Uh, it's only that, that uh, they're not covered now that we're talking about, about adding them. So... Uh, social, state and local government workers were not included in the original Social Security legislation in the 1930s because there were uh, issues of constitutional concerns about whether the federal government uh, could impose taxes on states. I mean, you see this in the deductibility of state income taxes. You see this in the non-federal taxation of uh, municipal bonds, et cetera. So it's a longstanding issue. Uh, but gradually, uh, I'm not a lawyer. You should not take legal advice from me. But uh, my interpretation, our interpretation, is gradually this concern has eroded uh, over time. In 1950, the states were given the option of covering Social Security. Later in the 50s, there was a whole series of extensions. Uh, the Social Security reforms in the 1980s uh, prohibited state and local governments from leaving Social Security if they had already signed up. This was after the, the uh, three counties in Texas um, uh, departed from Social Security. And then in 1986, all newly hired so state and local government workers were required to be covered by uh, 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 Medicare. The legal distinction between requiring somebody to pay Medicare payroll taxes versus Social Security payroll taxes uh, escapes me. Uh, and then in 1990, Social Security coverage was mandated for all social state and local government workers that were not covered uh, by a separate retirement pension uh, from, from the, the state or local government. So from the perspective of Social Security reform, uh, it, I'd say it's a no-brainer, but let me say it's almost a no-brainer because nothing, nothing is quite as black and white as we would like it to be. But from the perspective of Social Security, adding state and local government workers would be consistent with the goal of providing retirement security for all workers. It would help Social Security finances over the next few years, and then this is where the almost comes in. Uh, eventually, it would hurt uh, uh, the Social Security finances. Uh, so it depends your your view on 
how it affects the finances depends on whether you think of the public policy concern as getting Social Security through the next 30 years and letting the next generation deal with it, or you think of the public policy concern as solving the long-term infinite horizon Social Security uh, funding shortfall. Uh, there's a number of intergenerational equity issues that would work better if state and local government workers were covered. Uh, in particular, uh, the earlier, uh, as Henry mentioned, there's this legacy cost, early generation of Social Security retirees uh, benefited far more than they put into the system. That cost is being borne by future generations. Uh, uh, and so having, there's no reason why state and local government workers shouldn't share uh, in that cost with the rest of us. All right, that's basically an inter and an intra-generational uh, uh, concern. So in that sense, state and local government workers that are not covered are three writing on the rest of us. So that's a, that's a, a strong way to say it, but analytically that's accurate. And then, of course, coverage under Social Security would, would improve the quantity and quality of retirement benefits. As Anne Maria mentioned, it's not just retirement pension. Uh, uh, there's also um, disability spousal issues. Uh, there's full inflation indexing uh, and uh, dependent coverage as well. And, of course, diversifying the funds of your retire funds backing your retirement uh, can only reduce uh, the risk associated with it. There's a few other issues uh, about why uh, Social Security coverage makes sense for state and local government workers. One is that vesting in state and local government pension plans tends to take a long time. Uh, so someone who's changing jobs every three or five years uh, could never get vested in a plan. Uh, and if they don't have Social Security either, uh, then they're out of luck uh, on both fronts. Uh, this is a particular issue for public school teachers. Uh, a big fraction of the state and local government workers who are not covered by Social Security are public school teachers. Uh, uh, and then there's WEP and GPO. Uh, I don't think I'm gonna spend any time on this except to say that Social Security coverage would eliminate the need for WEP and GPO, and that would make a lot of people happy. I'd be happy to talk about them more in detail, but, but uh, it's, it's a little bit in the weeds. Um, then uh, if you look at the Social Security report, Social Security Commission reports over the last 20 years, basically everybody recommends bringing state and local government workers into the system. Now granted, these people are looking at it from the perspective of Social Security, which is what I'm doing in this part of the talk. Uh, but even the 1997 Social Security Advisory Board, which famously split uh, into th uh, three different plans, uh, the one thing they all agreed on was that state and local workers should be, should be brought into the system. The one exception to this was the Bush Commission in 2001 uh, that Daniel Patrick Moynihan was the head of. Uh, but uh, Moynihan then went out of his way to write a New York Times piece uh, afterwards saying that there was enormous uh, politics involved with this issue. And uh, uh, if you read it, or if you read between the lines, you can basically see he's saying that they yielded to the politics. Now, other people uh, argue strenuously that there are policy issues, and we'll get to that in a second. Uh, but the point is generally from the Social Security perspective, it makes almost complete sense to bring in workers in. And the almost is only that Social Security is in long-term shortfall, so bringing more people into that system increases uh, the long-term shortfall. Okay, from the perspective of state and local pensions, it's more complicated. Uh, and uh, on the, as I mentioned, on the one hand, if state and local pensions are in worse financial situations than we thought they were a while ago, uh, then that highlights the insecurity of retirement benefits. One of the possible options for dealing with pension underfunding is either to cut benefits or to uh, let them erode, uh, if you will, via lack of COLA or, uh, or uh, uh, lack of other increases. So this, this, I'm not arguing for or against any particular way of fixing the state pension issue. I'm just saying that the existence of more funding shortfalls raises the concern about the security 
of state pension benefits. On the other hand, the harder the situation is that states face right now and that workers, state and local government workers face, uh, the more costly it is to add a new burden of uh, Social Security payroll taxes uh, to both employers and employees. So um, let me just turn now to some background on that before we look at some, some uh, other graphs. Uh, as I noted, about one quarter of state and local government workers uh, uh, are not covered by Social Security. That's up from zero again in the 1930s. So we're talking about an evolutionary change uh, from 75 to 100, not really a revolutionary change. Uh, most of the uncovered workers are concentrated in eight states, uh, as listed here. Uh, and so it's not an issue that, that all states don't cover their workers or all states cover half of their workers or something like that. Most of the non-coverage is concentrated in these eight states. So a particular question of interest is how, are the pen, how, are pension, how is pension funding doing in these, in these eight states? And more generally, what's the relationship between pension funding and the coverage of uh, state and local government workers under Social Security. So it turns out that the, the stylized fact is that states that have lower coverage rates also tend to have larger pension underfunding. And so uh, this is what this graph looks like. The line, I, I want to caution you a couple of things about this graph. Most importantly, we are not presenting this as a causal relation. Uh, we're simply trying to summarize the data. Uh, the second point is the data come from different sources. The, the underfunding comes from state budget solutions. The uh, coverage ratios come from CRS. Uh, and they actually represent slightly different years. So this is just meant to be a first cut at looking at the relationship between the two. We're not arguing at, at all that is causal. But the stylized fact seems to be that in states with more underfunding or, or states with less Social Security coverage, there's more underfunding. Uh, we've done this not only with the state budget solutions data, but with Pew data and with data from Novi Marks and Rao, and they get the same, the same uh, correlations. So this shows that this is the same graph I just showed. This shows funding ratios and non-coverage rates. If you look at um, unfunded liabilities as a state, as a percentage of GDP in the state, which is you know, a measure of how much resources the state has to pay, you find the same thing. I know this is upward sloping and the other one was downward sloping, but it's the same thing. This says that uh, states with higher unfunded liabilities also have higher percentage of uncovered uh, 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 workers. And if you scale instead by tax revenue, you get the same thing. The states, there's a positive correlation between uh, unfundedness and uncoveredness, if those, if those are words. Uh, the, sec the second issue then is uh, the relationship between state pension benefit levels and Social Security coverage. Uh, Alicia Minnell found that there was a little bit of compensatory behavior in state pension benefit levels, that states with higher benefits uh, uh, had lower, uh, or states with lower Social Security coverage had higher pension benefits. So in some sense, those states are making up part of the lack of Social Security coverage. Uh, Jeff Brown, in, a, in work recently, also found the same thing. Uh, we get similar results when we, when we look at the correlations across the data. Uh, uh, so uh, states with uh, uh, un the more uncovered uh, workers, the Sorry, the, the lower Social Security coverage has higher benefit accrual rates in their pensions. Uh, what I want to emphasize, though, is this is for full career workers. And the, uh, Andrew Biggs, by the way, at AEI, uh, is a source of the data on the pension benefits. So anything that Andrew Biggs and Alicia Manel agree on with respect to Social Security, I'm willing to go with as a, as a fact. Um, but... The caveat is this is for full career workers. And there's this big issue uh, that, that uh, as I mentioned earlier, the state and local pension plans, pension plans don't vest very fast. So it would be nice to have similar data on, on workers that, that are changing jobs, that don't end up vesting, uh, don't spend their full 
uh, lifetime in, in a state government. Uh, but in any case, it, it uh, confirms the results in earlier uh, studies. Um, lastly, I want to talk about cost issues. The, there's a big concern among state and local government worker groups that if you did this, you would raise costs. Uh, obviously, it depends on how the state pension responds. Uh, Alicia Minnell and others uh, found that if the state pensions respond by preserving first-year retirement benefit costs, the costs of new hires would go up by about 6%. Uh, that would raise state budgets, but not by that much, about 0.15% as an impact. The reason is that new hires are a small part of labor costs, pensions are a small part of, of uh, new hires. Obviously, as the workforce turned over, and a greater share of your workforce was covered under these new, under such a new plan, uh, those costs would would rise over time. Constitutional issues I already discussed, and and you shouldn't listen to me on legal issues anyway. Uh, so let me just mention that uh, having said all this, there's wide opposition to mandatory coverage uh, in the state and local pension world. Basically, every uh, state and local government and every state and local government worker group that has reported opinion on this uh, has opposed mandatory coverage. Uh, their main concerns are the potential increase in costs and obviously worried about benefit reductions in the systems that they've worked hard uh, to obtain. Uh, there's also this issue that state, both state and local governments and state and local workers uh, can free ride on the, on the legacy costs of Social Security, which doesn't get discussed much, but, but should be in the mix of, of the policy discussion. So um, this is actually a funny issue in that the proponents obviously emphasize the benefits of mandatory coverage. The opponents emphasize the costs. Uh, and they may well both be right. Uh, I, nothing that I read in the literature struck me as egregiously uh, unbalanced or wrong. And so this just makes it harder for policymakers. The, the issue obviously has become more urgent, uh, but more costly to deal with. And these are the types of issues that policymakers will have to balance as they figure out how, how to handle state and local government workers in Social Security. Thank you. See if we can, oh, there you go, right behind me. Which one advances? Good morning. Um, Bill's concluding slide kind of like takes off where I'm going to start, which is good. So first of all, uh, my name is Jason Fickner. I'm a senior research fellow at the Mercatus Center at George Mason University. I'm also a uh, adjunct professor down the street here at the uh, Johns Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies where I teach public finance. In my current life, I was at the Social Security Administration uh, as the acting deputy commissioner and chief economist. Um, caveats are as follows. These opinions are my own, not those of my employers, and do not necessarily represent people past, present, future, living, or dead. <laughs> uh, I want to frame some comments. Uh, first of all, I only have 10 minutes. I'm not going to get bogged down in methodological issues. Bill did a very good job caveating his paper, the correlations, not causations, different data sources. Uh, so it's useful for discussion. I won't get bogged down there. I want to focus on policy-relevant issues for discussion so that when we get to it, we can identify some of the opportunity costs and trade-offs of this type of proposal to mandate state and local workers join Social Security. Uh, some general thoughts first. The authors are approaching this paper with their motives in the right place. They are trying to improve retirement security for state and local government workers. I think we need to recognize that because sometimes the normative values are very important. They are here trying to do something to help people improve their retirement security. And I want to take that as a given because they're not trying to underhand state and local governments. They're not trying to screw people on Social Security or those with current pensions in state and local governments. They are trying to actually help people have a more secure retirement, which is why we're all here. But what about the empirical evidence? Does the empirical evidence support mandating new workers to join Social Security who are state and local government workers? Well, yes and no. Um, 
the authors do a good job of showing the correlation between the underfunded nature of the current pension plans in state and local governments and the number of workers who aren't covered under Social Security. Uh, that's the yes part. The no part is there's nothing there that says if we were to now start requiring new hires of state and local government workers, would they be better off? And would the state and local government finances be better off? Because in some ways, you've got to fund one plan or the other. So we don't have a question of whether or not the alternative is better than the current state. Uh, so with the policy goal of requiring all state and local government workers to participate in Social Security to a better, more secure retirement, it depends. Uh, the authors focus on just new state and local workers. I have all in here because there's a question of, as Bill pointed out in his presentation, if you look at new hires over time, with, uh, over time all new hires become all employees because you have rollover and people retiring. The second is, what do you consider a new employee? If we were to enact a mandatory coverage requirement today, Someone tomorrow being hired would be on Social Security. What about the person who was hired yesterday? Would you leave them out? What about someone who was hired three years ago or five years ago who might be better off under a new plan than the old? So we should also think about transition costs. We did this in the federal government back in the mid-'80s. Uh, we from the civil service retirement system to the first system. We allowed for some transitions to employees to pick in some ways if they were in the margin. So we should consider that as, as well. Um, some pros of including all or new state and local government workers under Social Security. Uh, mandatory coverage would be fairer. Bill sort of mentioned this. Uh, there would be a share in the legacy costs, and Anna Maria mentioned this in her opening remarks as well. Uh, there would be a share in the cost of socioeconomic benefits, basically helping to contribute to the overall level that people would be uh, less poor, keeping them out of, um, keeping them in a society in which they are better off, helps the social welfare system, economic growth, et cetera. Social Security provides a progressive benefit formula. Uh, Bill just touched on this quickly. No WEP or GPO, the when Nation Provision or Government Pension Offset, uh, we can talk about this in the question and answer. What I will say is that this ticks off a lot of people who are state and local government workers who had some intermittent time in the private sector. They get a Social Security statement. Social Security does not know they had time in the state and local governments. They don't get that data yet. So they've estimated the benefits as if they are poor workers than they actually are. And so you're going to get X benefit retirement. They retire thinking they're going to get X plus their Y pension. And the government says, wait a minute, you're getting a pension. We're going to reduce your Social Security benefits now. People think they're getting their benefits stolen from them. And they complain to Congress and the administration and Social Security, you just took our Social Security check, we want it back. Sorry, that's not how it works. So it's very confusing. And so adding them would get rid of this. I will add that there are no new data agreements. So starting in 2017, Social Security should be able to start getting some of the data from some of the states on the pension issues and covered employees. So we may be able to be, at least be better able to tell people whether they're going to be subject to WEP or GPO. Uh, mandatory coverage will result in better quality benefits. Uh, Inflation-adjusted benefits, addition of survivor and disability benefits, improved retirement security as Social Security benefits cover the entire work history. Again, this would be better off, as Bill mentioned, than those who only have a few years in state and local government or hop in and out and have intermittent coverage. This would help to provide a more consistent coverage base. It would also remove a moral hazard problem. Bill kind of alluded to this but didn't actually get into it very much about why do we have some states that seem to have a large unfunded liability and also a large percentage of their workforce not covered in Social Security. Part of this is there's an incentive if you are a um, labor union trying to negotiate for higher wages for your state and local workers uh, and you go to the politicians and say, we want a higher wage, the politician says, I'm sorry, I can't afford to raise taxes on, my, on uh, the taxpayers right now, but I'll tell you what, I'll give you a higher benefit guaranteed tomorrow. And we'll just assume we're going to get an 8 or 9% discount rate and rate of return. And so there's no cost. I can't give you this raise today, but I can give you a raise in pension benefits tomorrow. So I think what we're seeing is an incentive, a moral hazard problem, to promise higher benefits than are, can be afforded today because we don't want to see it in higher wages. It's a gimmick. And that's in some ways led to this problem of an underfunded pension system. And so by having people covered under Social Security, you kind of remove that moral hazard problem. Also, for a lot of state and local governments right now, they're very concerned about their access to credit markets. Um, because of the pension system underfunded, there's a question of who's going to pay for it. Will the courts mandate that the states have to raise taxes to cover it? Will they allow you to cut pension benefits in retirement? How will that affect the government's ability to borrow and pay for money? That leads to uncertainty. Uncertainty leads to a higher interest rate to borrow. That leads to higher costs for local governments. By adding sort of people to Social Security and state local workers, you might have some predictability then in the financing, which could help lower the interest costs for state and local governments today. So it's important to think about the credit market access issues as well. Some cons. Uh, would Social Security provide more, quote unquote, secure benefits in retirement? Well, you're trading one underfunded pension plan for another. 
Uh, as we know, the Social Security system right now does not meet the 75-year test for solvency. The delta just gets larger with each passing year. We add some new employees today. We get some revenues coming in, but the costs increase in the future. Uh, what's more likely, to have a cut under Social Security or a cut under state and local pension? Are you trading one off for the other? Which is more secure? I don't know. Uh, state and local government funds for current pensions would now go to Social Security, or some of those funds would, which could worsen the already underfunded state and local pension plans. So how it's financed, the transition, is also important to consider. Would this lead to higher in state local taxes, regardless of what we do? So again, there's a question of how are states and local governments going to fund their current gap? Are they going to raise taxes? Is it going to be on payroll taxes? Will it be on uh, property taxes? Will it be sales taxes? That's an issue regardless of whether they transfer over to Social Security or not, and that's a question that needs to be explored. Uh, either way, workers will likely bear the cost of transition, again, probably through lower wages. One of the hypotheses now is that pension benefits have been higher guaranteed in the future or they've been promised to be higher in the future in exchange for lower, lower wages today. If that benefit goes away and they have to pay for it, perhaps we'll actually even see lower wages. So in some way, shape, or form, workers have to bear the burden of this. Uh, also, what will adding these workers do to retirement security for existing workers covered by Social Security? Again, if we add new state and local workers, there's some revenue coming in, but in the long run, it worsens the financing of the trust fund. So for those who are already on Social Security, does that mean they're going to face higher taxes or they're going to face more of a benefit cut? Uh, how are we going to fund those issues as well? Which leads to the question of how do we pay for the shortfall in the long run of newly covered state and local government workers when we haven't covered the shortfall for existing workers in Social Security today? Uh, a quick note on cost, and I'm going to go quickly because I've seen I'm running out of time. Um, the authors rightly discuss uh, the trade-off between advocating those who advocate for mandatory exclusion because they get higher, better benefits and those who are arguing against due to higher costs. But I point out that costs due to state and local governments have been understated for a long time, hence why these plans are underfunded. A lot of this discussion has been on the discount rate, what can we promise based on rates of return. A lot of state and local governments are using 7, 8, 9, 10% discount rates. They should probably be using 3 or 4. Um, so we've been understating the costs all the time, which means maybe we need to have a more realistic discussion about what the costs are when we talk about whether or not we should mandate a change. Uh, again, the authors talk about the idea of constitutionality. Like Bill, I'm not a lawyer. I don't play one on TV. But I question whether it actually is or not. They point to the fact of Medicare, and now state and local government workers without a pension have to be covered under Social Security. Um, but we've seen with the ACA debate and the Medicaid expansion in the courts that maybe not, we can't put these mandates on the states. So we're in a hyper-partisan environment right now, let's be honest. Uh, it's best to convince the state and local governments and the employees that to transfer is in their best interest. Um, because voluntary participation is better than mandatory, it reduces opposition, and basically gets legitimacy. Uh, this is my last slide. Um, we need to demonstrate that transitioning to Social Security for new state and local government workers is financially better for both workers and employees at state and local government levels. We haven't done that yet. We need to start doing that. Similar research is needed if we need to transition existing employees, not those with 40 years of, of uh, employment history, like Bill mentioned, who are 60 years old, but those who might be at the margin uh, with maybe five years or less. Again, keep in mind that costs to state and local governments have likely been underestimated for a long time. These true costs are becoming evident now and only grow over time. Uh, equity or fairness is in the eye of the holder, both from an individual standpoint and an inter- and intra-generational government viewpoint. There's an idea of whether or not transitioning will be fair because of legacy costs and socioeconomic costs being borne. But what's fair to one person might not be fair to another. So keep in mind that equity is a subjective term. For state and local government, the trade-off is upfront costs for longer-term benefits. For Social Security trust funds, the trade-off is upfront financial gain for long-term costs. That was Bill's concluding slide. Uh, which one do we value more and how do we then weigh off the trade-offs? The burden of any change will likely fall on workers, uh, increased payroll taxes or reduction of benefits. But whether you pay now or whether you pay later, you're going to pay. One of the problems I have with the discussion going on today on state and local pensions is that people still be look are looking for the elusive free lunch. One side looks at it and says, if we just hold out, the market will get better. We'll get those 10% rate of returns again. Don't worry. We'll be able to pay benefits. Another side says, oh, don't worry. We get to the point of the fiscal cliff where we can't pay benefits. Politicians won't let it happen. We won't cut your benefits. They'll be forced to raise taxes. But you've got now a citizen base who's not wanting to see their taxes go up. So there's no free lunch here. We've got to pay one way or the other. The longer we wait, the higher the cost and the harder it's going to be. So we've got to figure this out sooner rather than later. From a political standpoint, again, voluntary participation is preferred to mandatory participation. Thank you.
Hello, I'm Teresa Gellarducci. I'm a professor of economics now at the New School for Social Research, which is in New York City, and I'm a fully vested member of the pension uh, community. Um, thanks to see some new faces and for many of my colleagues in that debate. Um, thank you to the Brookings Institution and for the Arnold um, Foundation um, to provide uh, yet another sensible paper on this radioactive issue about whether or not state and local government workers should be um, in the social security system. This um, certainly connects to the previous um, session in our seminar today because this is about a mandatory coverage in a universal pension system for all. That's actually what we're talking about. And I think uh, one of the headings on your slides, Bill, made sense. Uh, mandatory coverage just, just makes, sense. <laughs> um, um, makes sense. Makes uh, sense. Further um, advances in this paper um, could be, uh, maybe perhaps for, for the research, is what you touched on, Jason, is about the nitty gritty about how to move from um, here where we have pockets of state and local government workers, teachers, police and fire mainly, who aren't in the system, um, to the system. Could they buy themselves, can they buy their way into the system? Um, what kinds of taxes, what kind of relief from Congress could help with this transition cost? So somebody needs to do um, those nitty gritty and you were right to, um, to point that out. Um, but I recommend this paper to everyone. It's almost a perfect um, piece, a template for a policy paper. I really, even though I've read much on this issue, there are some fresh angles here. One is this very clear point that experts agree that if we were going to design a system, we would put everybody in it. There were political reasons why clergy were not included, why agricultural workers were not included. There really are no good reasons, even political reasons, why um, some state and local workers were excluded and some weren't, except an historical point, and I want to lift up those plans, those states that had plans before Social Security. Bravo. Thank you for setting the way um, for the nation to provide pensions um, for their employees. And again, to refer back to the other session, 23 states had old age security legislation being considered or drawn up the year before Social Security was passed. The way we do federal policy in this country is to experiment in the states. Thank you, Illinois, for those experimentation. But it does make sense not to have these state by state plans. We're doing, we're all working very hard to get these state by state plans, but doesn't it make more sense for everybody to contribute more to Social Security in an advanced funded plan, perhaps a sovereign wealth fund managed by professionals, invested correctly, and then paid out in annuity on top of our Social Security system? That would be what experts would design if we could start from the beginning. But this is a normal pathway for American policy to get to where it makes sense. So back to the issue of bringing all state and local government workers um, into the Social Security um, system. As Bill pointed out, the um, experts had agreed it would make sense. Um, the winners would be diffuse. Um, uh, across the country. The debate about whether or not they should be brought in uh, was in a very particular context, and now I understand why it never advanced. The context in which these issues were brought forth were in debates looking at a Chinese menu of ways to solve the Social Security solvency problem, and you would pick out Exp um, expanding the earnings base, raising the payroll tax, a whole series of issues. And there at the bottom were adding in all state and local workers, and it brought in a little bit of revenue. So it sort of fit the whole meal, um, but the stakes weren't very high. And so we had been debating this in a context where it really didn't matter. And the losers, the employers and the representatives of the employees, had a lot at stake. These police and fire and teacher plans were highly fought for. These were big contributions um, to these systems, and they were tailored for the employers of, of record. 
um, every employer, employer and employee group have a personnel reason to have a uh, their own plan, and each one was delicately designed. So the losers were concentrated, and they had a lot of stake in it, and the winners were diffuse. So in all policy settings, that's a reason why a sensible thing that would have been built in the system um, doesn't pass. But what this paper does is point out that the losers may not be represented, um, that the losers may be all those um, police, fire, and teachers who are in plans that are struggling with a mature system and can't keep up. So the risk of not getting those benefits are higher than they were 10, 20 years ago. They're also the vulnerable group of workers that are not represented are those that move between different states, contingent work, private sector, and um, state and, and local work, who actually don't have good vesting in any of their, those plans. Again, going back to the first part of our seminar this morning, a need to have a portable, universal, mandatory pension system that not only solves what Josh Gottbaum said is a major problem, non-coverage, over half of workers today do not have anything at work. Coverage is a problem, but there's a middle and third step to a good pension system. Proper investments and a reasonable, efficient payout system. Right now we have a system in Daniel Biss's words that is tragic and doesn't work. We have long-term investments going into 401ks and defined contribution plans that are all dedicated to short-term liquid investments. There's a huge mismatch between the major reason why we save and where we save it. That's an accident, and it makes no sense for a, an economy that wants to grow. So we need a system where the fees are low and the liabilities and assets are matched um, uh, more sensibly, long-term savings to long-term investments. We also need a system that pays out annuities in an efficient way. Social Security, defined benefit um, plans, institutional investors have done it for, for decades. So we need to use that financial infrastructure to get every piece, coverage, investment, deaccumulation, right. Um, again, the paper is an Excellent piece of work, a little more balanced than, get, than Bill's presentation. The pros and cons are there. Again, I want to emphasize that the cost of non-inclusion is actually growing. Um, Bill, you want to make your graphs, making that case, go all the same way, <laughs> right? Um, um, so that you, um, you don't bury your lead. It's a very good compilation of evidence of the growing risk and the identification of vulnerable workers who aren't, um, who aren't covered. There's one more group of workers that are also hurt by this scattered coverage. And those are people that are locked in to their pension system because they're teachers and they're, or they're police or fire that really have to stay because their important employee benefit is not portable. That's creates what we say in labor economics, a monopsony situation. And ever since Bagoo, Joan Robinson, and John Hicks, um, giants in economics, this situation where workers are locked in with an employer um, creates a, a situation for monopsony exploitation. So it's important for workers to be fully mobile so they can fully realize their own potential to match their abilities um, with the proper employer. So it's another hidden law, um, set of losers. There's another reason, and Jason so, um, so clearly um, lifted it up, is that this actually may help state and local finances. Um, that if the pension costs are clear to all bondholders, it will be easier to sell the debt. Universal pension coverage to the flip side of that, would have been very helpful in the Detroit bankruptcy, municipal bankruptcy um, discussion. Those city employees were not covered in Social Security. Th thank goodness they were covered in Medicare. But those negotiations were bogged down because those pensions were everything to those um, city employees. So, God forbid, we look forward to more municipal restructurings, universal coverage, settle those issues. The second reason why this issue is important is it lifts up to the reason we're here, and that is a way to have a universal 
guaranteed national advanced funded system that supplements a, a strengthened insolvent social security system. So thank you, Brookings, um, for this morning. So we are already running late, so we'll speak faster. Sure, I can, um, I can do that. <laughs> uh, so we can actually take some questions. But I'm just going to start with a, a simple question, and I wanted to um, tell Bill that you know, as a European, in a sense, you know, we find it very strange, or that you know, not everybody is covered, right, by a social security system. And of course, you know, history um, has happened that way. And of course, now it's so much harder now if you want to mandate. Um, this coverage. So I'm going to use first like the doctor approach of first do no harm. So I don't want these Massachusetts people showing up at your door. And my question is, can you say a little bit more about, you know, who are the workers who would, you know, benefit or not mm -hmm. versus a social security coverage? And second, you know, what do the workers think? I haven't seen any evidence, but did anybody ask or is there any survey about, you know, for example, the worker really thinking about these issues and perhaps demanding it? Uh, in terms of who would be most effective geographically, it's the people in those eight states I listed, Ohio and Massachusetts in particular, have extremely low rates of coverage. Uh, in terms of the types of professions, uh, I think Teresa mentioned uh, police and fire, and I mentioned public school teachers, and uh, all this stuff happens, as you mentioned, for historical reasons. Right. Uh, if you set up the system now, you wouldn't have, you wouldn't presumably set it up the way it, it started and evolved. But, yeah. but you know, we we are where 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 we are. Uh, your second question was. How about the worker themselves, right? Is there any evidence uh, about what they would like? So, uh, as I mentioned, I talk most of the worker groups, in fact, all of the worker groups, as far as I know, that have issued opinions on this have said they don't want to join Social Security. Mm -hmm. uh, and there are obvious reasons why, which is the increase in, in costs. I thought Jason's framing of when the costs and the benefits come in each of the programs was actually quite yeah. uh, instructive. Uh, but there's also this fact that doesn't get mentioned in the analysis or press releases of the employee groups that, that they're avoiding paying the legacy costs of Social right. Security. And estimates are something like one quarter of Social Security revenues essentially are going toward paying legacy costs. So mm -hmm. uh, we would all like to avoid having to pay legacy costs, but they are, but they are out there. I think it's important that we still focus again on the idea of cost, because this is, this is a kind of important issue. And I did my slides. I used the word underfunded. I admit the first word I typed was fraudulent. Uh, I thought, well, that's accusing someone of being something, doing something illegal. I shouldn't say that. Maybe I should use the word misleading. Um, and I paused. But the thing is, you think about how these pension plans are being sold to state and local workers. What they're being sold on is this is guaranteed. They're constitutionally protected. They can't be taken away from you. So if they're underfunded, we'll have to raise taxes to pay for it later. Don't join Social Security. That's going bankrupt. We're safe because we'll, but we'll be forced to raise taxes to cover it. If that assumption is false and you can actually, through bankruptcy, and I'll see this in Detroit, go after retirees, then that is not a true statement anymore. And we're misleading people to think that their state and local pension is more secure than a Social Security pension. And that gets in the idea of how do we actually define costs. Uh, if you go and promise someone today a benefit tomorrow, you should fully fund that benefit today. State and local governments, by and large, have not been doing that. They've been misrepresenting those costs. And I think that's the important. We start talking about costs. We really be have an honest discussion of have these been properly funded? Have we been properly discussing and measuring costs? If not, we're short. We need to make that up one way or the other. And I think the more discussion we have with state and local workers, that they realize their pensions may not be secure, that may change the perception of whether or not it's better to join Social Security or not. So let's be a little bit provocative, but uh, <laughs> I can do that. 
<laughs> no, I don't. Let me uh, ask the question. But actually, you had some comments, so I'll let you have uh, the comment, and then I'll ask the question. Oh, just, just simply, I would um, not go as far as, um, as Jason. Um, many plants have been underfunded for decades. Um, I can, and my car it was running mm -hmm. on half empty for 20 years. So I'm, mm -hmm. you can run a plant as long as you do the normal, the normal cost. Um, it actually keeps benefits low in most places. Um, I was a trustee in Indiana for, for quite a while. Um, but, so I just want to frame this. Yes, the paper talks about the growing cost of funding these generous plans who aren't, don't have Social Security coverage. And that is a risk. But the main reason to include um, everyone is because the design of universal coverage makes more efficient. So we, right. that will lower the cost later on. So just to be Sorry. provocative, you know, let's maybe think more of it in a dynamic way. You know, we are trading an unfunded system for another, and is there a chance, right, that, you know, when I listen to these smart, you know, senators or, or you know, the work that they are doing at the state level, is there a chance that the state might have more flexibility? Um, or, for example, that they can invest, you know, in riskier assets, that they can find a way to do so or so on, and I'll let you answer and you know, just bash this idea? Uh, I, every poll that I've ever seen lists Social Security as the single most popular uh, program. I think Americans regard it as a birthright, at least those that are in it. <laughs> and uh, I, if I had to bet, I would bet that Social Security benefits were safer than state government oh. worker pension benefits. Uh, and just quickly, um, many of us in the community feel that it was a, um, an accident of history that state plans were not covered by ERISA. Mm -hmm. There were constitutional issues that were settled just a few years after ERISA was passed. And so the flexibility states had wasn't such a good thing, that if they had been covered by ERISA, we probably would not have the problems that you are stating now are in the public plans. I'd only sort of add this idea of uh, states with flexibility. They, they, they do have flexibility to put things into market assets. But be very careful you start thinking about the idea of trying to chase returns. Because what you're doing is you need to think about a pension plan. You are basically funding something today to pay out of student benefits in the future. And so if you're guaranteeing that, you need to have as much money up front today to weather sort of ups and downs in the market so those benefits are there when you need them when people retire. And so if you say, I'm going to assume an 8% rate of return, 9%, and you don't get it, you start chasing into more riskier assets. Pension plans should use a risk-adjusted rate of return, depending on the guarantee they're actually offering people, which means a lower discount rate and assuming rates of maybe 3 or 4% like Treasury bonds. So you've really got to balance this out. And so while the states do have flexibility and should utilize that, they should also be very prudent in how they invest and not try to chase higher and higher returns, which could actually be more risky, and actually result in losses to the program, not better gains. Let's actually open the floor now for questions because I think this is really important and I see these hands uh, uh, up there, so I'm going to give it to Kathleen and of course to Daniel. I'm talking to Senator Biss. And when I look at the eight states that are not, um, you say are lower funded, they're mostly, fun they're fairly wealthy states. These are not poor states. Um, so. If I'm in that state, I think they can afford it. I know, for instance, that if Illinois had the same tax system as did Wisconsin, it could fully, fully fund its retirement system. So there are other answers if you're at the state level. And if you're going to have a judge whose pension is going to be affected by a lawsuit, which has happened, they're going to make sure that they are required to fund that system. At least that's the case in Illinois. I don't know what the law was in, in, in Michigan, but s some of those states, the way this discussion has gone is as though all the states are the same, but Illinois is, uh, has its particular situation. And you know, Massachusetts is a pretty well-off state and could fund their employees if they wanted to. You, they may not want to, but it's not like these are poor states. It's not, it's just interesting when you chose those states. Can I, can I bring, bring up on that? Because you make a great point. Um, and, and this is going to have a in Maryland with taxes. You can see it going in and out. How do you want to pay things for revenues? The, the issue comes, it's not whether states can afford it. 
It's are the citizens willing to pay for it through taxes or something else? And it's the willingness. And the problem you see in the public choice perspective is that too often politicians are willing to say, I'll pay you a benefit tomorrow for a hamburger today. Uh, it's the old Popeye approach or hamburger yeah, approach. Wimpy. But, wimpy, thank you. <laughs> and, and, and the issue then becomes, if, if they're not willing to do it, this goes to the states and courts level. In Detroit, because the, um, the governor was a little bit more proactive, basically filed the bankruptcy in federal court, and the federal court pulled out the states and said, sorry, you can't do it. We're not doing it in the federal. There's no way we had the public choice problem of a local judge saying, I want my pension protected. Right. The bankruptcy judge took it out in the federal level. Right. So again, my, my caution is, and I want to make sure people understand, I'm not advocating for or against this proposal. I'm actually agnostic. What I want is a realistic discussion of the opportunity costs and trade-offs that come with this one way or the other, and a realistic discussion of what are you basically basing your assumptions on. Are you basing the assumption on that the courts are not going to let these plans go under in a, in a fully promised basis and that taxes will have to be raised? Or are you saying, no, there's a chance they're not going to, in which case you should consider Social Security and the balance of which one will be less, more funded is maybe better no, working here. So I wanted to really have our senator speak, but I also wanted to acknowledge that you know the, the Georgetown Center for Retirement Initiative mm -hmm. is doing mm -hmm. a lot of work at the state and local level. So I really hope that you follow their work, and mm -hmm. uh, you know there is a lot uh, coming out here. So, so this is a much more. <laughs> That's why I said that. <laughs> this is a much more specific, narrow question, and it's for I think Bill, um, maybe all of you. This question of whether there's a correlation between offering Social Security benefits and having a lower yeah. uh, external benefit level is, in Illinois at least, not abstract at all. We have lots of employees in each category, and there's a very different benefit package. The ratio, in fact, is 1.67 to 2.2. So I think that the employee, employee groups, as you call them, or unions, as a lot of us call them, um, <laughs> are... They're, they're right when they say that this change would very likely result in a decrease in the pension benefit. And my question for you specifically is if you thought about the impact of that transition on the liquidity and cash flow and long-term funding status of the state and local pension plans in question. Yeah, that is a great question. Um, and I was running out of time at the end of my uh, talk with the part of the paper that uh, addresses that. Uh, it clearly depends on how state pensions respond to the inclusion of their workers in Social Security. Uh, you can think of uh, the one the one change I mentioned was that if they normalize be pension benefits so that first year benefits under the old system are equal to first year benefits under the new system with Social Security, then you get the numbers that I presented. Uh, and that, that sort of, uh, that strikes me as a reasonable benchmark because uh, it would leave the combined system more generous than the current system because Social Security is indexed uh, for inflation, fully for inflation. Uh, but there are other ways to do it and, I, you know, it, it's pretty, uh, the laws of arithmetic still hold, it's pretty mechanical, the, you know, the more you adjust uh, state benefits down, uh, the less retirement security you've added. Uh, but there's also this notion that Social Security provides a broader array of retirement benefits like disability and spousal and in particular complete inflation coverage. Uh, and so the quality of the benefits might go up even if the, mm -hmm. even if the first year benefits don't. But it's, it's, I agree, it's a key question. Would you like to add? And again, I've not run the math for Illinois or other states, so I'm just going to sort of bills work. But again, think about the um, the transition and as well as the time span of costs. So again, for Illinois, Chicago, et cetera, uh, a lot of people in the credit markets are looking at those governments and saying, we're not sure how worthy our borrowings are raising the costs. That raises your interest cost today. So you've got interest payments being higher than they would be normally. Does that delta cover the cost of transitioning to a social security program? I, I don't know, but that's a math you can do. Again, when you have some predictability, Markets hate unpredictability and stability. If they have predictability and stability, you get that lower rates, help, and that might help. That and, that, might and the thing is, can, yeah. you, can you model that yeah. so Bill can do some sort of model that shows them the trade-off yeah. between high interest rates, lower rates, and the transition costs? We only have a few minutes left, so can you take more questions? There is a question over there. And please, let's keep it uh, question brief. Um, so current law generally says state and local governments put your workers in Social Security or you have to do something else. You have rules that kind of flesh out what that something else is. Um, Bill, did you look at 
those rules and think about whether or not those those rules create an incentive for employers with workers out of Social Security to stay out and potentially cut benefits to to you know especially when they're under fiscal pressures with underfunded pensions to cut benefits in the future to levels that maybe are too low from a retirement security perspective. That's a really interesting question. If I can rephrase that and tell me if this rephrasing is correct, if a state Basically, the rule is if a state doesn't cover its workers, it's got to enroll them in Social Security. Uh, if it enrolls them in Social Security, it has a payroll tax, employer payroll tax contribution that's required by law, by federal law. If it doesn't, if it keeps them in its own state pension plan, it has much more variability in what it contribute, when it, when it contributes, and how high those benefits actually are. So uh, I interpret your question as saying uh, states are, are, are keeping their options open given the current law that they either have to cover people or put them in Social Security. They're keeping their options open by covering them uh, rather than committing to having to pay a certain amount in payroll taxes by sticking them in Social Security. If, is that a... Yeah. I mean, my focus is really on the benefit level question of, I mean, there are standards in the rules now. Um, don't ask me to, to repeat what they are, but there are standards in the rules about what benefit levels need to be, whether depending on whether it's a DB or a DC, and do they give states too much flexibility to, to provide inferior benefits for people who are outside of Social Security? Well, in terms of DB, I think the concern is the vesting, a concern is the vesting period. Uh, which I mentioned is longer, tends to be longer in state, state plans than private plans. And even after you're vested, there's, there can be a pretty long period at which point you don't get back more than the actual contributions you actually made. And so, so uh, I think that's a big concern, but again, it, 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 I hadn't thought of it this way until your question, but what it does is give states more flexibility than if they commit to Social Security. Senator, do you want to add briefly to this? Briefly, if more states that choose they can't do it. crazy, but it's legal, the requirements Really? If the state wow. were to go that route, oh. put workers You're not guaranteeing them that, a, there needs a to be benefit paper. payment. You're guaranteeing yeah. them a you're fund. Gonna, you're gonna right? And that's it, right? So it's, it's not a pen DB where you're saying, here's your payment. It's saying, here's your contribution. That's why it's there. It's an important part for the yeah. Thank paper. you. Okay, yeah. the question over there. Um, Wait for them. Yeah, that, the mic. Funding, but, but uh, it seems to me there's also a credibility issue because certain politicians have periodically uh, advocated for um, private privatization of Social Security or other funds. So there's a not just a funding question, it seems to me, with Social Security, but there's a, a long-term credibility. What will it be in yeah. 10 or 15 years? And secondly, um, when the federal government shifted from the old system to the new system, most people believe that if they opted for the old system, they were better off. And their public sector unions talk to state public sector unions. So if, if I were a state public sector union, I might look at the federal example and again have a credibility issue. So my okay. question to you all relates to those kind of credibility yeah. proposal issues. Um, yes, uh, real, there's really good research out of the um, University of Minnesota that looks exactly at those, uh, the first issue. Um, Jacobs has actually has looked at the um, flex, uh, looked at the um, cy cyclical opinion about whether or not Social Security is solvent. So it's not a long-term credibility issue. It actually fluctuates, and it fluctuates with utterances of political elites. Um, so if the president is saying we should privatize Social Security, or three times says it's an insolvent, ins unsustainable problem, credibility goes down. If another presidential candidate who's rising in the polls says, this is an easy fix, we need it, it's an important program, credibility goes up. The same thing happens um, in the more local issues about what 
um, union leaders might be saying to their to their members, or as you say, they're transmitted from federal employees who stayed in FERS um, to state locals. So my answer is that it very much depends upon leadership and evidence shows that the utterances and framing of political elites matters a lot. There's no long-term um, credibility problem. It fluctuates. Well, uh, we are already late, so thank you for staying longer, but please join in me. I'm sorry, to, thank, uh, you. thank you. Thank you.